Burada zaten uzun var bu arada. Biliyorsunuz. Ee, Kimin uzun var? Herhalde en üstü. Bu, bu şimdi siz genetiksiniz. Buna ihtiyacınız yok değil mi? Bu tarafta değil. Bunu kapatıyoruz. Bunu kapatıyoruz. Ben şu eşlik için Herkese selamlar. Sesim geliyor mu? Geliyor hocam. Bağlı hocam. Okey. Bir teknik bir e, sıkıntı sebebiyle hibrit versiyonunu, toplantının biraz böyle farklı odalarda hibrit şeklinde yaptık. E, Çok mu şey oldu? Karanlık mı oldu? Ben de arka piyano ayarlamaya çalışıyorum bir yandan ama. Yo, hocam tamamdır. Bence başlayabiliriz uygun zamanda. Ee, I think we are recording both at YouTube and also everybody is getting connected and there is also a group of students in the classroom. So uh, what we can do is uh, Because of the technical difficulty, the hybrid will be an interesting hybrid. Uh, Ban Hoca will first present uh, upstairs in his office, in her office, then come down and answer the questions to the students and online. So that's what we're going to do uh, with this official arrangement. If there is no objection, Ban Hoca, uh, 
since I am like outside now in front of me, uh, uh, please uh, go ahead and introduce uh, yourself and also the, the seminar and the floor is yours. I have, I think they gave you a, a permission to share. Okay, thank you very much, Cengizan Hoca. Okay, so as Cengizan Hoca already uh, explained the situation, so we had some technical difficulties. So I, I need to run between rooms, but that's okay. Let's start with the, um, um, the online version of our talk. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Could you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, then. So then let's start. Um, so I think most of you already know me. Um, therefore, I would like to just dig into the uh, topic, today's topic. Um, so what we will talk about today is the design of nanocarriers for drug delivery and diagnostic applications. I will try to show you our approach um, and the work that we are already doing in Wozic University and also um, the work that we are doing in collaboration with our um, colleagues uh, um, worldwide. So um, let's start with a very basic um, introduction. Why do we need to design nanocarriers for nanomedicine? Um, actually, it it's, has a very simple answer. Think about um, if you administer a drug to your body, where does it go? It will go um, definitely to all over your body. And um, this, is, this is like a, a food eating. So you kind of eat the drug and depending on the route of the administration, so you will encounter, the drug will encounter different obstacles. But anyhow, it will be spread to a uh, whole uh, of the body. So therefore, um, this is, for example, not a very big problem, maybe if you are taking a painkiller. Um, so if you have a strong liver, then it can fight uh, with it. But uh, think about if um, we are trying to cure a cancer. So uh, those cancer drugs are really very toxic. And uh, that's the reason why we need to design nanocarriers for uh, uh, making them active only a specific part of the uh, body uh, that can function um, only the part of the disease part so that we could decrease the side effects. Um, so as you can see here, our, then we have to ask ourselves, how could we do this? Um, there are some design criteria uh, for this purpose. We need to, first of all, uh, have the controlled and selective release of the payloads. And this will be um, obtained by um, making these nanocarriers uh, with the targeting, connecting these nanocarriers, recognitive systems, actually. What I mean from this is uh, we can decorate the surface of the nanocarriers with some targeting ligands, like antibodies, some receptors, which are only uh, specific um, for the cancer area um, so that um, they could be active and um, higher uh, um, located in those targeted um, portion of our body. So, um, but of course this is not enough. Um, we need to also have uh, stability and intactness. So what I mean from this is we can actually divide it into two. Uh, one is that um, the stability, physical chemical stability actually. So that means that we need to keep these nanocarriers alive in the body. So they should not be um, um, distracted, they should not be um, damaged or degraded. So they need to keep their uh, function until they do their task. So in the second point of view, of course, so they need to have a, um, sufficient circulation because our immune system is trying to get these chlorine uh, uh, carriers, chlorine elements, uh, and uh, of course, uh, try to protect uh, us uh, from these chlorine uh, um, elements. 
So that's why in order to keep them um, longer time in the bloodstream, we need to also do some surface modification. So we need to keep these uh, nanocarriers, hide these nanocarriers uh, from the uh, um, immune system so that they could be there uh, for a longer time to do their task. So um, of course, definitely biocompatibility, biodegradability is something that we need to also impart. And after they do their task in the body, they need to, of course, clear it out from the body uh, uh, without leading to any toxicity. As you see, um, so it is not an easy task. So there are a lot of uh, criteria to design a nanocarrier. So um, what we do is we try to reach these um, nanocarriers design for biomedicine by using different kind of um, carrier systems. We are favoring lipid nanoparticles, for example, polymer nanocapsules, polymer nanoparticles, and also metallic and metal oxide nanoparticles. We combine these structures with the uh, polymer nanocapsules capsules mostly to use them as uh, sensory uh, uh, devices or bioimaging purposes. Of course, we could use them for drug delivery and also synthetic biology as well. But in today's uh, uh, talk, I will mostly show you a drug delivery, biosensor applications and bioimaging applications of our uh, design. Um, OK, so let's see here. Um, so I, I was hoping to make this actually um, also uh, presentation from the class, so then I would uh, uh, show you some uh, animations, more animations too, but anyhow, uh, uh, it doesn't matter. So let's continue um, with the online version. So um, here you see, I divided our scope and the today's talk into four groups, as you can see. The first part is that I'm going to explain to you is the controlled and selective drug delivery for cancer therapy, our results, our recent work. Uh, uh, of what we do for controlled and selective drug delivery. We use mostly lipid nanocarriers, as I said, polymer and polymer lipid nanocarriers. In today's um, talk, I will start uh, uh, with lipid nanocarriers and also get in touch a bit of our results uh, um, for our uh, hybrid nanocarriers. And afterwards, we will talk about um, how we investigate the stealth properties of nanocarriers uh, for prolonged blood circulation, because this is an, as I said, important issue uh, to keep them for a longer time in the body. Um, so then we will continue with the um, nanocarriers that we have developed for diagnostic applications. So here I will talk mostly about light responsive nanocarriers um, that we can use both as a nanothermometer. Um, or uh, for biorecognition tools. But in today's talk, I will talk about, show you some examples of our uh, nanothermometer-based uh, light responsive nanocarriers. And also, um, we are also producing some magnetic nanoparticles uh, and combine these structures with uh, some capsules for MPI and MRI imaging. And lastly, uh, so very, very brief uh, introduction of our recent work, um, recent Tupita project, uh, which is about combined and targeted breast cancer therapy. Okay, so let's start um, with the lipid nanocarriers for breast cancer targeting. So this was a work which was published in 2022. Um, so, uh, and here what we have done was we uh, cover, we produce some um, wax-based nanoparticles and modify the surface of the particles with antibodies which are specific to uh, breast cancer. And um, in this uh, work, we have also encapsulated some drug mimetic, uh, so some hydrophobic drug mimetic. Actually, since these particles were made of lipids, so uh, our aim was also to host some um, very uh, hydrophobic uh, uh, drugs. Um, so they could be, we thought, of course, they could be a good host for this purpose. Um, then um, what we have done, as I said, we use some HER2 antibodies and also some uh, immunoglobulins as a control uh, antibody and cover these uh, nanoparticles to make them specific uh, for just the uh, breast cancer area. Okay, so this is uh, basically how we synthesize them. Um, so 
we use these methods in most of our nanoparticle uh, production. So we um, use a mini emulsion templated methods. So basically, um, it's a simple uh, and easy method. You just need to optimize the condition, of course. The formulation takes some time. Um, so you dissolve the lipids and oils and solvents that you need to use to dissolve these uh, um, lipid structures. And also, um, you dissolve your stabilizer in water and emulsify them. Um, we also use uh, ultrasonication to decrease the droplets in the nano uh, um, um, structure. So then finally, we could obtain, uh, um, of course, we do some purification to remove the excess drugs and so on. Then finally, we could obtain these kind of uh, nano uh, carriers made of uh, wax uh, uh, lipids. So um, afterwards, what we have done, of course, we needed to check the physical chemical characterization. So um, if we could really encapsulate those drugs, and those drugs were so it's, it was a drug mimetic. So I have to um, underline this. It was not a real drug, but the, the one which we could mimic uh, the drug we use. And it shows the fluorescence uh, properties. So therefore, we could easily monitor uh, this drug by fluorescence uh, following the monitoring the fluorescence intensity. And we were uh, sure that our drug is there. Uh, drug mimetic is there. So afterwards, we also check uh, uh, the differential scanning calorimetry uh, thermogram of these uh, carnoma wax based nanoparticles um, so that uh, we could ensure uh, uh, the drug uh, encapsulation as well as the uh, lipid uh, um, availability as well. So this was also uh, the result of it that we could um, support our. Uh, nano carrier uh, design. Also, actually, here we were trying to understand how is the uh, uh, this, this process ended up. Um, so our idea was that so you basically actually mix these structures, ultrasonicate, um, and then solidify it at room temperature. And this was also a, a proof of it um, by the support of the BSC thermogram. So afterwards, what we have done um, was uh, we continue with the antibody functionalization. So this is the, actually here, there is a critical question, of course, maybe some of you already asked it uh, to yourself. Um, how could we um, modify the surface of a wax uh, uh, a base material, um, since it doesn't have any really any reactive groups or any functionalities uh, that we love to use uh, for such kind of functionalization approaches. So that was a critical point for us. Uh, but then what we have done, uh, it was actually, uh, it worked very fine and easy. Uh, we cover the surface of the wax um, nanoparticles with the antibodies by using a, a pH dependence absorption method. So um, we perform this absorption, as you can see, at different pH values. Um, so then finally, when we monitor um, and characterize our final nanoparticles by flow cytometry, we have seen that. Um, so in the right side here, you see uh, the uh, this is the HER2 uh, antibody, which is specific for breast cancer. And we see there was a really higher absorption when the pH was acidic at 2.7. In the immunoglobin one, um, again, the trend was uh, uh, more higher. The antibody uh, functionalization was higher in the acidic pH, as you can see here. But it has a, a bit more uh, um, absorption, um, I would say. So after that, of course, we were very happy. So uh, that we could um, have our antibodies on the surface, but it was not enough, definitely. Um, so then the second question for us was, is it really um, stable there? So um, because we usually, uh, for such kind of functionalization, 
wanted to have a covalent binding, so which is more and more strong. Um, but uh, of course, some of the absorption physical binding could be also uh, strong, I would say. So uh, then to understand this quantitatively, we performed some um, calorimetric uh, investigation. So isothermal uh, titration calorimetry measurements were done. Um, basically, this method is based on um, you have your um, two elements. In this case, one of them is the uh, wax nanoparticles. Uh, the other one was the antibody, two different antibodies. In each uh, set of experiments, we titrated the antibodies into the um, wax nanoparticles. Then afterwards, um, we monitor the heat uh, um, rate um, by this calorimetric method, and you are now seeing the results, uh, the absorption isotherm of antibodies um, to uh, wax nanoparticles. Here is so this blue one is pH 6.1. We have done uh, immunoglobin uh, antibody uh, absorption on the wax nanoparticles at pH 6.1 and pH 2.7. So the black one is the 2.7, and here. Um, so you see the green uh, curve is the pH 2.7 absorption condition of the HER2 antibody. And as you can see here, um, at 6.1, um, we couldn't have any absorption. But the good point here is we could also calculate how much antibody uh, was present on the surface of the wax nanoparticles. So here you can see that um, uh, so we we had uh, actually certain number of uh, uh, so antibody and our association constant which is the um, showing the how strong our um, antibody binding is and um, it it is association constant is also higher uh, at these acidic conditions for both of the uh, antibody and functionalization. So um, that was something nice for us. By the way, I have to also point out that after we make our uh, antibody absorption at pH 2.7, we um, redisperse these nanoparticles in water environment or different PVS 7.4 environment, we could use them for further purpose because some of you might think that so then if you are doing everything in pH 2.7, how could you use it in the real uh, environment, right? So that's, but that was not the case. We were doing only the functionalization approach uh, at this pH and then we dispersed them uh, in the uh, all daily life uh, buffers uh, and other pH values. Um, okay, so this was um, the, then afterwards, so we were sure our functionalization approach, we were sure that our antibodies were uh, on the surface of the uh, wax nanoparticles. Then we continue uh, with the cellular uptake. Here you see, um, so this is a concentration dependent and time dependent cellular uptake towards uh, the uh, HER2 positive breast cancer cells. Um, of course, here we were trying to understand um, if, are HER2 decorated, HER2 antibody decorated um, nanocarriers to target really the, these breast cancers or not. So then what we have done, we use both the control uh, nanocarriers and also the uh, um, antibody, uh, HER2 antibody decorated nanocarriers here. And as you can see, so we have, especially when we increase the time, we could uh, clearly observe the higher uptake uh, um, and we could clearly observe the targeting activity at different uh, concentration. But um, what was more interesting for us was we were also um, curious about how stable they are. So usually, actually, if you are a uh, um, um, fabricate those monocarriers, it's the rule of thumb that you keep some portion of it and then uh, you check the stability uh, for a certain time. So, and stability is uh, um, usually the physicochemical aspect. So actually we are doing this uh, uh, most of the time. 
but we were not doing the biological uh, uh, stability check. And in this work, we were also very much curious um, about our targeting activity after six months. So we keep them, store them in the fridge, and then after six months, we use those uh, nano carriers again um, to let them uh, uptaken by the breast cancer cells. And as you can see here, we preserve the um, targeting effect even after six months. And that was a, a, a cool result for us uh, that we were happy actually to have it. Of course, uh, the physical chemical characterization like TM, uh, uh, that's a potential size uh, was also preserved. So that was the first thing, as I said, that we do. And then we could also check the biological uh, stability. Um, okay, so to sum up this book, um, yeah, we got the long-term stability in terms of physical chemical integrity and targeting activity. We could encapsulate the hydrophobic drug mimetic in here. And um, we could also have a, a strong binding of different uh, kind of antibodies. And we checked this with uh, uh, also some analytical uh, characterization. And we uh, uh, were ensured this uh, condition. Um, so uh, we use also in this work, uh, these natural waxes actually. Uh, usually um, I am a very much fan of polymer uh, person. So since I'm, uh, my last decade of the life uh, uh, went through with polymers, but still synthetic polymers may lead to some toxicity. And that's why we turn our faces a bit more the natural uh, uh, materials. And this natural waxes was, I would say, a, a nice one to use uh, uh, as an alternative to safer non-medicine design. Um, as I said, we could also observe a success, successful targeting towards um, HER2 positive breast cancer cells. But was that uh, sufficient? So the, is the story ended? Um, not really. Then uh, we also continue um, to think about how we could um, improve these. Um, approach to impart some stealth and control delivery task, actually. So as you may have already told, um, this um, nano carriers with the antibody functionalization um, doesn't have any pH responsivity or any selected tools any um, to release the drug at certain spaces. So the drug release would be uh, uh, happen in the system um, by uh, um, a passive diffusion. So therefore, we decided to cover these wax nanoparticles using different kind of polymers, um, either natural polymers. So this is one work that we are right now continue uh, um, in the Bind Lab in Boazic University. We use some biopolymeric conjugates, we uh, form some biopolymeric conjugates to use them as a stabilizer to cover these um, lipid wax nanoparticles. We also use some smart polymers, uh, which could also act as, as a both stabilizer. And also these smart polymers are pH responsive so that we could uh, release the drug. Uh, we could impart even more selectivity to, to this system. And afterwards, uh, uh, we could release our drug at a certain place. So that was the idea. So I will show you a few uh, results from those uh, ongoing work as well. So um, this is the using smart polymers as a stabilizer part is uh, done in collaboration uh, with uh, Leibniz Institute of Polymer Research uh, with some old colleagues. Um, so um, they provide us these polymers. And these polymers, as, as I said, so they are both actually have some reactive groups so that we could uh, you perform click chemistry. So uh, which is the winner of uh, this year's Nobel Prize, as uh, I assume you all know. And uh, we could further functionalize the surface by uh, adding antibodies by click chemistry. And also they have a pH sensitive units so that if we can cover the surface with these polymers, 
they can uh, uh, release the drug by the pH manipulation. So that's why uh, we again uh, use our uh, produce our wax nanoparticles this time with this polymer uh, uh, coating. And here are the, some uh, nice um, electron microscopy results. So um, so they finally uh, we have uh, a, a azide clickable, and these. Polymer says, as you can see here, um, also a PEC polyethylene glycol, which could also enable us uh, um, to keep these nanocarriers in the uh, blood a bit higher due to the hydrophilicity of the PEC. So um, then finally, we could obtain these pegylated and clickable hybrid nanocarriers, which has the uh, lipid inside and uh, has the polymer outside. Um, this is also to check, of course, the pH responsivity, um, how we could actually manipulate them to release the drug. As you see here, they could swell and shrink in acidic state and basic states, about three times swelling in the acidic state. So hopefully that, that might uh, lead us to release the drug. So it's an ongoing work. So therefore, I cannot show, right the, uh, show you the release, uh, drug release studies. Uh, but I can show you another uh, approach that we are using to cover the surface of uh, uh, this kind of wax and nanocarriers. Uh, in this work, um, we this time produce some natural polymers um, using albumin and polysaccharide, different polysaccharide conjugates. And then um, we also encapsulate uh, some drug cancer drug, which is pecotaxel, as you can see here, uh, which has a, a very problematic water solubility, I would say. So they are um, uh, really very hydrophobic. Um, but luckily, right now, so um, my students in the mine lab uh, uh, deal a lot with these solubility problems, even when we are encapsulating them, but they could solve it. Um, so here you see the different conjugates that we are using. We are um, forming, making match of albumin, dextran, or albumin, pectin, or guar conjugates. So here you see the results. So first, of course, we have to um, ensure this conjugate formation. If they are, again, uh, uh, forming uh, a stable uh, binding between them. Um, so afterwards, we um, produce this lipid core um, albumin polysaccharide base uh, uh, coating. Here you see the results. Um, so we, we could have even a smaller nanoparticles with this approach, which we were happy actually. We could also encapsulate pacotaxel in a higher amount, as you can see uh, here. Um, so now this is also a bit ongoing work. Um, now Sedef is mostly working um, with this work and trying to release these drugs with uh, enzyme responsive approach. Uh, hopefully soon um, we could have more results in this part as well. But um, up to now, in this part, we deal with some kind of, um, as I said, different um, hybrid and nanocarriers, how we could make them um, targeted uh, uh, delivery use or selective drug uh, release use. So let's go to right now another aspect. Um, we also, as I said, investigate the stealth properties of the nanocarriers. So uh, this brings us to the uh, a term protein corona. Um, so when we inject uh, the nanocarriers to our body, so they will deal with lots of different um, biomolecules, um, proteins in the blood, and these uh, uh, proteins would like to stick to those nanocarriers, as you see here in our hypothetical uh, uh, image. Uh, um, so. Uh, and then afterwards you have, they could reach to the cancer cells if we are talking about cancer therapy or 
macrophages, our immune system could recognize them and get them and eat them so they could be cleared out very fast um, before they reach uh, uh, the disease area. So therefore, um, what we are doing also um, in this work, um, we produce some known uh, uh, nanoparticles, I would say. PLJ nanoparticles are used a lot in this field because they are uh, degraded into very non-toxic uh, ingredients. So therefore, uh, people in nanomedicine like to use these nanocarriers. And in this work, we also use it. As you can see here, these are the SEM pictures and these are the TM pictures. We again use a similar approach to produce them, the mini emulsion templated approach. And finally, we could have a, a nanoparticle about 250 nanometer, uh, um, so which is a, a slightly a negatively charged because we um, also stabilize these nanocarriers with uh, some uh, uh, steric polymers as well. So afterwards, um, what we are doing is um, we are incubating these nanocarriers with um, either human plasma or uh, fetal bovine serum uh, for in vitro studies. And then uh, after the incubation, incubation um, we centrifuge them. And finally, uh, we have uh, the structure nanocarriers uh, with the soft protein core, with the hard protein core. I'm sorry, what that means. So if they are still stick to the surface, that means that they will be uh, um, most of the time with these nanocarriers in the body. Of course, there may be some exchange, but anyhow, uh, we could analyze the structure if uh, they, uh, uh, which proteins they have on the surface or not. This will give us the um, fate information about the fate of these nanocarriers uh, in the uh, journey. Uh, uh, during blood circulation. So as you see here, of course, uh, this is, we usually as a rule of thumb, check the size, the uh, dispersity, uh, of course, that's a potential for the stability purposes and so on. As you see here, either they are plasma coated, um, fetal serum coated, or these are control groups without any coating. We couldn't see any uh, much differences in the uh, size or size distribution. That's also good because then um, they are still alive, so we didn't. Uh, uh, they could survive at least uh, from the integrity point of view. Uh, this this gives us an idea about that. So then, um, how we actually analyze the absorbed proteins? The first thing that we do is the uh, SDS page, the, the protein electrophoresis, and then uh, Damla is working from my group uh, with this work, and she uh, uh, did this nice uh, um, SDS page with either um, FPS or plasma proteins. And um, so, so then we could have some idea actually, uh, what do we have uh, um, on the surface of the nanocarriers? But this was not enough, definitely. We collaborate for this work with the Max Planck Institute, uh, the Katarina Landfestas group, and also some part of the work uh, uh, done in there, uh, Damla was there. Uh, for a couple of months. And here we also conduct with them um, mass spectroscopy to understand the protein distribution on the surface of the nanocarriers um, more precisely. Um, so there are a lot of things here you see. Uh, I will say to you, summarize to you only uh, uh, the take home message, I would say. Um, in the resulting structure, either we um, interact with these nanocarriers with plasma or with the, uh, for our in vitro studies um, with the FBS, we have seen that serum albumin and lipoproteins were higher uh, than the remaining uh, proteins. That is something nice because these uh, albumin and lipoproteins uh, may uh, uh, help us actually um, hide these nanocarriers from the immune system in a better way um, so that they could keep their uh, um, stay uh, longer uh, and gain stealth properties. So we are uh, um, trying to actually expand this work also um, to check how uh, uh, these uh, will be affected um, on the drug release perspective as well. Um, 
Okay, so let me continue with the second half of the uh, talk. Um, up to now, so we talked about the drug delivery, uh, how we actually design these monocarriers for drug delivery, what I would say. So uh, the things that I already told to you about the stealth properties, about the targeting, uh, it could be also applicable for diagnostic applications as well. Um, because you anyhow need to make these things um, more specific and targeted oriented uh, um, to make a diagnosis, early diagnosis, I would say. Here, I would first uh, start with uh, some, as I said, um, nanothermometers, uh, how we could um, use them for early diagnosis of cancer. Um, in this work, what we have done was um, we um, try to, I would say, monitor the temperature in cells using some special um, polymer based, polymer based up conversion nanocapsules. So to use them as local nanothermometers. Um, how actually we do that? So I would not go more in detail to the optical phenomena that we use, but this is a special. Um, optical process called triplet-triplet annulation of conversion. Let's um, yeah, make it as a general name, give it as a general name. It's a photon up conversion process. So, uh, and this is temperature dependent. We um, favor this in our temperature sensing approaches. Um, let's dig in to the topic. Why do we need actually to design a system to feel the temperature in cells? It's a very challenging approach, but um, as you may all uh, can think, um, if we think about the normal cell division and cancer cell division, um, I'm sure the biologist would say even more and more to me about this, but if we compare this, um, the cancer cell division is uh, faster, they could uh, produce more heat in comparison to healthy one. And if we could monitor this small uh, heat difference, actually this temperature difference, sorry, not the heat difference, the temperature difference between the healthy and the uh, cancer cells, that would be a, a great thing to use in early diagnosis of uh, cancer. Actually, um, one thing, which is better uh, if you are dealing with cancer uh, ter therapies and so on, it is better to have detect them in an early uh, a region than to cure them, actually. So this is also something that we should think maybe uh, for working in nanomedicine. So, okay, but it's definitely not an easy task. Um, what are the challenges to design an intracellular nanothermometer? First of all, the size limitation. Limitation. So the material that we design needs to be small enough to enter the cellular compartments. Otherwise, we could not get a, a live um, um, result signal um, from the uh, um, area that we would like to monitor. Also, um, we need to have a um, local heat monitoring without influencing the real cell temperature, definitely. So we are working in a very delicate world and these materials should not really interfere with this uh, area. Definitely it should be biocompatible, we need to have good cellular uptake and how we could do it. So there are different ways to do it, but usually optical uh, uh, approaches are combined uh, in this world, I would say, and our uh, solution uh, to develop a temperature uh, sensor uh, in a, a cell environment is to combine the polymer nanocapsules with the photon up converting system to design a luminescent nanothermometer. So this would bring me to the up conversion nanocapsules, which are made of this kind of structure. The idea is we encapsulate some light sensitive molecules, which could perform these uh, photon up conversion process. And uh, we, when we shine the light, um, with a, a lower energy, we could have, so the, these uh, 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 small guys uh, uh, encapsulated in the capsule can uh, uh, perform all these uh, um, photon uh, up conversion uh, uh, process 
And when you shine uh, it with the uh, red light, you can obtain uh, the uh, light, which is higher energy, uh, the delayed fluorescence. And this delayed fluorescence is um, temperature dependent. So if we could get the signal, make the system alive, working in an ambient environment, then uh, we can uh, use this uh, as a nanothermometer. So, um, okay, here, let me a bit go faster because the time is going uh, um, uh, very fast, I would say. Um, the, these are the capsules, our conversion nano capsules, uh, the electron microscope images. They are about 220 nanometer. Here, the important point is we produce these capsules with two different cores. So again, the design of nano carriers actually come into the scene here as well, because um, since we would like to make this system alive in the cells, of course, there will be lots of oxygen in the environment. There will be oxygen diffusion. And these uh, optical phenomena, uh, here maybe I can show it again, needs to function in an ambient environment, in the presence of oxygen. But this system is also sensitive to oxygen. So therefore, what we have done, we produce uh, the capsules with both uh, um, some vegetable oils. We use in the system rice bran oil, but we are using also olive oil, for example, right now in our uh, um, uh, lab. So uh, also with some solvent, actually, hexadecan, which doesn't have any uh, um, oxygen blocking ability. So then here you see the uh, uh, results. Um, when we have the rice bran oil, the vegetable oil inside of the capsules, they actually give us the, this delayed fluorescence which we want to have it for the uh, temperature monitoring, um, as you can see here. But if when we use actually the uh, hexadecan, the solvent inside of the capsules, then this um, red one is the result of that uh, control nanocapsules, then you couldn't have any of the uh, uh, resulting signal, a signal fluorescence because uh, during this uh, um, photon upconversion process, all these uh, light sensitive molecules are die because of the oxygen, oxygen bleach them uh, all. So, but since we could um, obtain a functioning um, nanocapsules, uh, luminescent nanocapsules, which has the vegetable oil inside um, at ambient conditions, we were very happy. Then we continue to, uh, 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 give them to the cells. Uh, these were the HeLa cells, and uh, HeLa cells like our uh, nanocapsules, our conversion nanocapsules, a lot. Um, so then, actually, this was a kind of a starting and model uh, um, system uh, that we would like to check if our nanothermometer works or not. Therefore, we wanted to have really high amount of capsules inside, and we choose the six milligram per milliliter. So normally, uh, uh, as you might think. Uh, so these small numbers are of 0.5 or, or even maybe less is enough um, for the uh, drug delivery and so on. We choose this higher amount and then continue uh, with the temperature uh, um, uh, sensing experiments in HeLa cells. As you can see here, um, when we increase the temperature from 22 to 40, so this is the part that we monitor the delayed fluorescence part. Um, so here we got a really three times differences. Um, so, and we uh, could make a sensing, we could make a variation um, when these um, polymeric upconversion nanocapsules are encapsulated, uh, so uptaken uh, by the HeLa cells, and we could get the signal directly from, from the cells uh, with this uh, experiment. Um, so afterwards, so um, what I would like to show you also, um, this is another work, another capsule actually, a self-assembled capsules. This time we are not using the um, mini emulsion templated methods, but we are 
producing our capsules by the self-assembly behavior of the amphiphilic local polymers. I usually call them the sisters of liposomes because liposomes are famous since they are, uh, you know, also used uh, in nanomedicine commercially as well. Uh, um, so by the, in the name of the uh, doxil. And uh, so um, therefore, um, these sisters of liposomes made of polymers, we use this in this work, we did different um, uptake, enzyme uptake, both nanoparticle uptake. This was more like to uh, use this structure for synthetic uh, cell approaches uh, to mimic the cell-like functions. Um, this is also a very hot topic, I would say, but what I would like to show you is more the gold nanoparticle uptake because I would like to connect it to today's work uh, a bit, uh, our current uh, ongoing work in the lab. So uh, in here, what we have done um, with different approaches, we um, encapsulate five to 10 nanometer size gold nanoparticles into these small, it was about 120 nanometer size uh, capsules. So these uh, uh, black ones uh, are black dots are the gold nanoparticles. And this is the, um, yeah, this is the, uh, our capsule membrane. Um, so, this was actually, we, we could use either post-loading approaches. That means you form the uh, nano capsules and then you uh, uh, swell them because they were pH sensitive, then let the gold on the particles inside. This was important for synthetic cell mimicking approaches because our cells are also getting the, you know, uh, uh, ingredients um, uh, by this post-loading approach. And this was a bit to try out that. But um, now I'm coming uh, to a bit a recent work. Um, they have also the drug that the pH sensitive, these polymer bond capsules have also uh, drug delivery, pH sensitive drug delivery uh, um, ability, as you can see here. So we could uh, release the drug in acidic condition in a higher amount than the uh, normal physiological condition, which can help us to. I use them in a selective uh, drug release as well. So now what we are doing, taking these, combining these two um, uh, structure, um, a bit more advanced materials right now in, sorry, in bind lab. And um, again, in collaboration with uh, uh, the old colleagues, uh, they, uh, we worked, uh, Gizem does some of the parts uh, in Leibniz Institute. She was also a few months there. And we produced some um, sugar decorated um, superparamagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, as you see here, about 12, 16 nanom uh, nanometer. And as I showed in the gold nanoparticle uptake, we are trying to encapsulate these uh, magnetic nanoparticles into these nanocapsules. So then uh, our actually um, I approach is, aim is, uh, I would say, uh, to use them as a multimodal nanocarrier design for uh, ending up in an image guided drug delivery so that we could, because if you can encapsulate these kind of iron oxide nanoparticles, at the time we also plan to encapsulate drugs. So they are good uh, uh, host uh, to, uh, you know, uh, load different kinds of ingredients. Then we could use them for both uh, MPI imaging uh, MRI imaging, um, so then we could also uh, release our drug uh, at a certain point. This is also actually, um, I forgot to add here, but uh, we are collaborating uh, uh, with Emine Hoca from UNAM, uh, from Bilkent University as well, so. Okay, so let's come, another work, uh, ongoing work of our, uh, so Yamur and Dylan is working with this work, so we are also encapsulate, producing some gold nanorods. In this work, we are trying to uh, um, end up again, uh, multimodal nanocarriers. I like to actually, I believe that the future of all these nanocarriers are uh, the ones which could do several abilities in one pot. So therefore, um, right now, our ongoing projects are all uh, towards this condition. And in this work, also, we try to um, um, produce 
nanocapsules in combination with these nice gold nanorolls, these are also very, very fresh results of uh, uh, Yamu's uh, um, work. And we could obtain combined um, chemo and phototermal targeted cancer therapy. So it's another ongoing work of us. Uh, we also plan to decorate these structures with some antibodies. And um, in one pot, uh, uh, we could do many things. But of course, um, we need uh, people to do all of these uh, uh, different uh, advanced structures. So this brings me to also an announcement. If any of you uh, like to do uh, a PhD work uh, in this topic, um, this is a part of our uh, to be, to be talked 22 to 47 um, uh, project. And I'm looking for PhD students, um, postdocs. Um, so I have scholarship for this. And of course, the master students are also all welcome. Uh, you can contact with me. Yeah, so last but not least, uh, actually, acknowledgement is the uh, most important part of the uh, uh, of a talk, I would say. So I would like to thank uh, to uh, my group. Um, so this is we are a very young group. Um, so it's been two years that uh, we build up uh, our uh, biofunctional nanomaterial design laboratory in Boazici University. Um, we have funding from Tubitak or and Boazici University. Um, I also would like to thank to LifeSci, uh, um, uh, actually, because uh, they, they are great facilities, especially in electron microscopy and light scattering methods. We are uh, using utilizing it a lot. And here, um, so the work that I showed mostly, um, SEDEF uh, is doing uh, the uh, polymer hybrid nanoparticles. Dylan is also supporting uh, uh, this work. Damla is working with STELT uh, and nanocarriers protein corona work. Uh, so Gizem is doing magnetic nanoparticles. Uh, we don't have, a, a, so this was an old photo, I would say. And we don't have Yamu here, and Yamu and Dylan is working also in the uh, our uh, recent Tubitak project for the combined uh, um, cancer uh, therapy uh, development. Um, so, of course, I need to thank to my collaborators as well. So, uh, the uh, uh, Brigitte Voigt and Reed Murat Helhans group uh, in uh, IPF. So, we are still uh, continue working with them. And as I said, uh, um, Nizam was there, that done some part of her work there. I also would like to thank, of course, the uh, uh, group, Athena Manchester group in Max Planck Institute. Uh, um, so we also uh, uh, collaborate still with them. And some part of the works were done uh, in, in Max Planck Institute. So thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you, I was looking thank you Bana Hocam. So this is going to be an interesting hybrid arrangement. We, we, we don't actually see the students in the classroom, but I, I'm told there are a bunch of them. I also got myself into the office. But the, let's say, I guess, uh, unless you there are questions that come back, we can come back to the presentation. We can stop the presentation. Okay, should I go to the class or how should we? I don't no, know. No, no. I mean, I think let's continue in this uh, fashion, I presume. Let's, okay. If they have questions, I'm sure they will find a way to uh, ask them because I have a student there who's sending me a chat messages. So uh, why don't we stop the presentation? Okay. Yeah, they would find me, I'm sure. So students can find me anywhere. Uh, okay, so here. it's in, uh, it, uh, or... Uh, 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 Ban Hocam is in the building, so if you have uh, additional questions after the exam, you can always after the seminar you can always find him. If uh, so, we still con we are still alive, so uh, let's go ask some few formal questions here, and for the uh, the most exciting uh, and secret questions, we usually stop the online uh, <laughs> recording and then leave them afterwards so are there any questions from the student let's uh, see the uh, uh, participants faces especially the ones that are officially taking because i i'm also gonna take a snapshot of uh, for official participation for people who are taking bm 579 and uh, 700 are there any questions from the audience uh from the ones, uh, any questions to Ban Hoja? Let me start by saying, uh, 
what I mean, there seems to be countless op, uh, con, um, optimization of these, how you assemble, assemble and attach few things on these nanoparticles. This is a general question. So uh, what can you actually have in terms of uh, uh, intellectual property or patents on these? So each combination is patentable or what you need to actually have to change in order to have a unique uh, uh, patent application? Okay, so thanks for the question. It's a good question. So it's, um, of course, depends. We are limited kind of um, with the surface modification of the lung carriers. And most of the time, the reactive groups in that. And if we have these reactive groups, usually, by the way, we are also kind of uh, uh, lazy. We would like to use the simple and uh, easy functionalization approaches. Um, and click chemistry is one way, for example, that we are favoring a lot because they are very efficient. And if we can put those reactive groups on the surface, I think we can um, attach any ligand there. So we have um, sort of um, higher palette in, in this regard. But if we cannot, like the one which I showed, for example, for wax based nanoparticles, then um, so we then need to somehow find a way to maybe go to the physical absorption that worked for this uh, um, carrier. But still, we are thinking about covering the surface with again absorbing some polymers onto it. Actually, I would not restrict and limit ourselves. Anyhow, we need something to like each other, maybe. And this is most of the time some reactive groups or some absorption units and so on. Um, this depends a bit our creativity. It's like a logo, <laughs> so Lego, I would say, Lego world. Uh, and we can, that's why I am saying always design of nanocarriers, um, depending our creativity and of course the chemistry and material science enables us, uh, we can do sort of lots of uh, um, functionalization. But are all the, all of those then, uh, it, these are, I mean, I'm sure that these are endless research questions, but in terms of translation mm -hmm. and getting into the clinics, are mm -hmm. all those Lego combinations independently uh, unique, patentable? Um, patentable, you mean to, to have a patent? or what? Yeah, you have a patent. Okay, because, so you are looking for because, on the... Because the things that you are attaching on mm -hmm. those uh, particles are specific, let's say, a map or something, mm -hmm. uh, antibody, which could have already developed for some additional purchases. Actually, you can uh, uh, get it uh, from a vendor, but yes. now you're, you're attaching it into a carrier which in itself is also uh, probably known in the field and already published. And uh, you put, like, let's say, a, a um, neoplastic agent, uh, which is a, could be a classical one inside the carrier, which is also already patentable or could their patent could be expired. But the combination of all of these for a specific application uh, does it reach okay. a new intellectual property uh, threshold so it can be now pursued uh, by a, I guess, translational activity or academic spin-off? Yes, actually, they are. They can be patented, I would say. Not all of the monocarriers we are using are already uh, uh, in the um, market or in the literature. We are making, designing our own uh, uh, carriers as well. For example, those wax nanoparticles, were made by us, I would, I would say, with this technique. And this pH-dependent absorption uh, methodology that, that is already patented by Max Planck Institute. So, and it is used for different uh, uh, nanocarriers as well. Uh, but for example, these kind of multimodal nanocarriers, and I didn't explain, of course, uh, all of them because we are right now uh, um, working on it. Um, but um, it is polysaccharides, uh, covering uh, um, protein polysaccharide covering of the lipid nanocarriers. These are actually um, some novel approaches 
that we are producing them in our own lab and they could be patented. And on the other hand, uh, let me come to your second question, like the, uh, for example, different ligands or different, uh, um, you know, targeting unit attachments to a surface of the nanocarrier that could be also patented, I would say, because in each case, you need an, another way to do it. If you already do an, another way, an alternative way, then you can patent it. But let me clear out, for example, if you produce a PLGA nanoparticle with a, a you know, uh, a known methodology, I think you cannot patent this. So if this is your question, but in our lab, we uh, favor most of the time, we produce our own approaches, own nanocarriers, because there is a problem and you have to uh, design your own nanocarriers. But sometimes like the PRGA one I showed to you, in that approach, for example, our aim was more like to, um, to analyze these protein corona effects and how we do this because we would like to translate it also our own homemade nanocarriers as well. But for those, you cannot, I would say. So depends on your um, resulting. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I explain lots of things, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> And the final answer is it depends. It can sometimes it can. It depends, sometimes it, it can. Sometimes. Be. I mean, if 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 this is then I would think. I mean, you should. I mean, there is a maybe possibility of sending a a patent each week or something from mm -hmm. from the lab. Maybe I mean, if that uh, would be an interesting venue of whether how this will be funded is another question, of course. But uh are there any questions and let me see i mean i have to do one more before uh, official documentation of one second okay i'm here but okay. we should maybe talk about this james Zanjan later because i am weak on these to topics i'm always thinking only the research and these patenting and so on yes you're right we have to uh, think maybe uh, i mean I'm, it's always an idea i mean if you if, if it's patentable it's first Makes sense to cover the patent, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, sub, it, it, you can at the same time start the publication process. But it is a matter of, I mean, taking another task on the many tasks we have as an academicians. So, mm -hmm. yes. oh, <laughs> see how it is. I mean, we are, we, of course, we can always do this chat among ourselves, Panoja, but I'm hoping that students will come up with some answers, uh, some questions about it. If there are questions, please raise your hand or write something on the chat. Otherwise, I got the information that uh, the people at the classroom has no questions over there to you, Banoja. So maybe we should, if there are no further questions, we can maybe thank the technical assistance team. And I'm going to a private chat with them also why we have cannot do this thing in the classroom, which is an interesting uh, new way of doing a hybrid. Uh, seminar a third way so far we are uh, we are doing an innovation in seminars i guess okay <laughs> so i mean uh, why don't we stop the uh, uh, youtube web streaming uh, i guess first of all i see it's still live stream upstairs yes i'll stop it right now Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Aisha is our administrative assistant from uh, taking care of our technical issues.